Now, in our response to reading for today, we read from the 16th chapter of the Matthew of Matthew's Gospel, where we read from the 24th verse, and we went over into the 17th chapter, and we read to the fifth verse. And in that passage of scripture, we saw where Jesus, he had a message for whoever desired to save their lives. We saw there in that scripture. And we saw where Jesus, he asked a familiar question. What profit is it to a man? We see him say there, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. He said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So within that response reading, within the passage of scripture, we see what was important to Jesus, what was on his mind. We see that, that our Savior, he had a great concern, not for the flesh, but for the soul. And the reason why he had such concern for the soul is because the Father's will is that the soul be saved from death, that, that the soul lives. Many people today, they, they try to find life by, by seeking what makes them happy, right? Many of us, we, we want to, to find happiness. We believe that if we can find happiness, that we can find life. But I think what, what many of us are confused on is we try to find happiness by the physical, by what we can attain, by what we can hold, by by what we can put in our bank accounts. That's, you know, if we, if we have a lot of money in the bank, we feel like we truly find life. We believe that we can be happy in our soul. Imagine that, thinking that something of this physical world can truly satisfy the soul. Which brings me to my key verse for today. My key verse for today will be the 24th verse there in the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel. If all of us, we have that, let us say amen. 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 We'll see there in the 24th verse that Jesus, he said this to his disciples. He said to the disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself let him take up his cross and do what? Follow me. Do what? Follow, me. Follow who? Me. And that me is who? Me. Why do you think Jesus was encouraging the people there to follow him? That's what he did there, right? And so I ask all of you today, will you follow Jesus? So, from that verse, I want to focus on, and I want to talk about today for a thought. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Again, my thought for today, on the first Sunday in February, is have you decided to follow Jesus? Now, throughout the month of January, I spoke about how there are many doors, didn't I? There are many doors. There are many paths on our journey. I'm in the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel. There are many pathways. There are many doors on our journey. There are many paths, in other words, that, that you and I, we can take in life. And all these paths, they may seem different, right? There are many choices that we can make in life. There are many different choices that we can make in life. But ultimately, as we saw in the month of January, these choices, they lead to two destinations, two end destinations, two houses, two schools, if you will. One of those destinations, one of those pathways being a pathway of mediocrity, a pathway to failure, if you will. The other door, the other pathway being a pathway of blessings, 
not blessings that come from the world, but blessings that come from the Lord, our God. Which door, I ask, will you go through? Which path will you go down? Now, if you turn with me over to the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, I want you to join me in taking a look at the 13th and the 14th verse. We'll get back to the 16th chapter in a moment, but I want us to take a look here at the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel. And I want you to take a look at Jesus here. He's speaking in the 13th and the 14th verse there about these two pathways. Jesus, he explained there in those verses that there is a narrow gate with a narrow path. All of us see that? He explained there that there is a wide gate with a broad path. All of us see that as well. So we'll see there in the 13th verse that Jesus, he explained that many enter at the wide gate. Many, Jesus said. Many enter at the wide gate and they go down its broad path. Now, if we think about that for a moment, because many are going down the broad path, that would mean that this pathway, it is one that has been cleared out. It is a well-traveled pathway. It can be clearly seen, which means that that pathway, it is one that is easier to take. Now, while it may seem like that is a pathway that is easier to take, Jesus, he warned there about that pathway. If we're all looking at it, we'll see that Jesus, he warned that the broad path, it leads to an ending point. And he said that the ending point, it's not a good point, is it? And Jesus, he warned that if you go down the broad path, the broad path, it leads to destruction. Now, what this means is that this pathway, it must not be broad forever. You know, if it was a wide path forever, there would be no end point with it. It would be eternal. But this broad path, it has an ending point. So if I had to liken the bride path to anything, I would liken it to a funnel. I liken it to this, a funnel. It's bright at this end, right? But look at it. There's an end point. You, you go down this, this, if I put anything in this and it's large, it's going to stop. And Jesus said that the bride path has an ending point. And Jesus said that it's ending point there. He said that it is destruction. And this is something that is very important for us to understand. Because again, Jesus said that there are many people who enter in at the wide gate and they go down the bride path. And so those who choose to go down this pathway, they are essentially living with a ticking clock. It's always ticking because that pathway is going to come to an end. And the more that you are on that pathway and that clock is ticking to the inevit inevitable, you'll find that people begin to be, get more desperate on that pathway. They, they begin to, to fight to survive on that pathway. Look at how many people are living in the world today. And so many people that are on this bride path in their fight to survive, they try to gain some kind of power that will help them to survive. And in that fight for power, in that desperation to survive, many people become greedy. Like I said, look at the world today. Many people, they, they are filled with apathy to where they don't care for others. Again, I say, look at the world today. It, it becomes a, a part of their lifestyle. Greed and apathy is, is how they live today because they believe that they will survive. They believe that they will live if they gain. And if they take on the mentality 
of every man for themselves. Now, there are others who are on that pathway who don't live with that mentality. You see, some travelers that are on this travel, this pathway, they will travel down the pathway just accepting life as it is. They won't try to, to change anything. They know that life has a conclusion and, and they won't do anything about it. So in other words, there are, there are others who are on this bright pathway that are accepting of their fate, if you will. Now, when one chooses this bright path, it doesn't seem like there's anything that they can do to save their life. They have, again, I want you to listen to this, they have chosen to be on that pathway. At any time, they can turn around on that pathway. At any time, they can get out of that funnel. They can climb back up. You don't have to stay on that pathway, but many make the choice to stay on that pathway. And the sad part about this is that many are choosing the fate of destruction. Even when warning bells are going off saying, hey, there's danger ahead. Even when there are warning signs saying, hey, turn around. There are many that are refusing to turn around. The exit signs are saying, hey, exit here, and you can loop back around. And many people say, I, I don't want to get off on 285. There's going to be a whole bunch of traffic on 285. I ain't getting off at 285. I ain't getting off on I-20. You know, all that traffic by six flags, I ain't getting off on I-20. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep on this pathway. Many are sadly on the pathway to destruction. Now, when we take a look at that 14 verse there, Jesus, he spoke about there being another path. And he said that that path, again, is at the narrow gate. He said that the path, it is not taken by so many. So it's the road that is less taken. It is the road that is less traveled. So again, if, if we think about this for a moment, and I'll make that funnel again for you all. Jesus said that there is a narrow path with a narrow gate, right? Look at that. And you know, you start off at the narrow gate It'll be difficult to see up here, won't it? It's difficult to see what is ahead. You can't really see what is ahead. It's the road that is less taken, and, and so not so many people have traveled down that road, right? And, and so there's a lot of hindrances that can be in the way when you, when you try to go down that pathway. If I had to liken it to anything, I would liken it to a, a deep forest, to where there might be a path, but you might not be able to clearly see that path because there's a lot of overgrowth. You know, there are a lot of uh, sticks and limbs and everything overhanging in that pathway. And so that pathway may seem a bit imposing. You know, you look at that, you're like, man, I ain't going down that pathway. I don't know what's, I can't see what's ahead of me. I don't know what's in that jungle. And so, you know, it, it's a it's hazardous path for, for one to take. Now, though this path may seem imposing, we'll see that Jesus said that the narrow path, that's the path that actually leads to life. We'll see Jesus say there in those verses. So that funnel that I made there, unlike that broad path, we saw that the narrow path, it expanded over time, didn't it? And so over time, it, it will become easier to walk on that narrow path that's expanding outward. And even so, that, that pathway expanding outward means that there are a lot of people that aren't going to be desperate on that path. There's not a fight for survival. It, it, and if you think about it for a moment, when you take a look at that funnel as it expands out, there's a whole bunch of room for you to even lay down and rest. And you don't have to worry about somebody trying to fight for some kind of power. You don't, there's no worry about it. There's no care about it. On that pathway, 
if you continue down that pathway, there seems to be a rest from all the fighting, from all the fuss, from all of the mess. Which path will you take? I ask you today again, do you desire to find life? Do you desire to find rest? In the 14th chapter of Proverbs and the 12th verse, the proverb is stated that there is a pathway. There is a way that seems right to a man, but it's in is the way of death. I wonder which pathway, which way was the proverb speaking of? I, I believe that it was talking about that broad path. So if you desire to find life, I would say to you, I would encourage you, you better not go in a way that may seem right to a man. There are many that's at the wide gate going down that broad path because they think that it is right. I would say to you today, don't you be at the wide gate. Don't you be going down the broad path. It's in this destruction. It's in his death. Now, the third chapter of Proverbs and the fifth verse, it speaks to those that desire to find life. And in my mom's favorite verse, we find that the scripture, the proverb, it says, don't you be leaning on your own understanding. The proverb said that you, you ought to be trusting in the Lord with your whole heart. You and I, we are to trust in God with our whole heart. Do you trust in the Lord today? And then in the sixth verse there, the proverb says that you should submit to God. And when you submit to God in all of your ways, the ways in which you will go, again, the proverb says that God will make your pathways straight. Which path will you take? Now, going back, looping all the way back around to my key verse there, the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel, there in the 24th verse, we'll see there that Jesus, he spoke to the notion of the proverb. Jesus, he said that again, one should deny themselves they should take up their cross and they should follow who? Me. They should follow him. I don't want to follow you, Briar. <laughs> but I, I, got, I know what you're saying, Briar. <laughs> but we should follow him. We should follow Jesus. Now, some may wonder, well, where is Jesus going? Where is he going to take me? You know, we... When somebody say, hey, follow me, you know, we be we, we have all kinds of questions. We want to know where they're going. We, we want to know who's going to be there. If, if certain folks are going to be there, we say, man, I ain't going. I ain't going to follow you there. You know, we, Jesus, he was asked the same question. You know, if, if somebody said, hey, Jesus, where you going? I'll follow you, but where you going first? Who's going to be there? You know, one of his disciples asked him, where you going? Thomas asked him that. Thomas asked Jesus, hey, where are you going? How can we know the way uh, of where, where are you going when we, we don't know where it is that you are going? And, and when Thomas had asked Jesus that, Jesus answered to Thomas, he said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus said, nobody, no person comes to the Father except through me. So where is Jesus going? Jesus said, I'm going to the Father. And where is the Father? The Father is in his house. And, and if you remember the 14th chapter of John's gospel very well, and if you don't, you can turn over there. You can see it for yourself. Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come again and I'm going to receive you to myself so that I can take you to my Father's house. Jesus said that he's going back home to the father's house and he wants for you to follow him to the father's house. 
So we know where Jesus is going, but the question again remains, will you follow him to where it is that he is going? Now, my hope is that you will say, yeah, pastor, I am going to follow him. Because I would hope that you desire to go to the father's house, the father's house being the kingdom of heaven. I would hope today that heaven is on your mind and that you have as strong of a desire to be there as I do. So will you follow him to heaven? Will you follow Jesus down the path of glory today? If you desire to follow Jesus to the father's house, down the path of glory, you're not going to find him at the wide gate. You're not going to find him going down the broad path because that path leads to death. It leads to destruction. Jesus said that if you desire to follow him, if you desire to make it to heaven, you need to meet him at the narrow gate. You need to meet him at the narrow gate. And if you're going to meet Jesus at the narrow gate, you need to be prepared to go down a difficult pathway. Uh Uh-oh. Something that I have shared with all of you, you've heard me say this a lot, is that it is not easy to follow Jesus. So when I say this next thing, I'm not saying it to you. I'm saying it to those that may make it this far in watching the video, to those who may be listening. It is not easy to follow Jesus. It is a difficult walk to follow Jesus. And and if you don't believe me, there was one that came to Jesus and said, hey, I want to follow you. And over in the eighth chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 20th verse, you will see there that Jesus said to the man that desired to follow him, foxes, they have holes. Birds of the air, they have nests. But I, Christ, the son of God, the son of man, I don't have anywhere to lay my head. There's no rest for the weary on this pathway. Again, you start out at the narrow gate. It's a difficult, a difficult walk. It is difficult to follow Jesus. But if you desire to travel down the path to glory, you must be willing to take the journey. You must be willing to follow Jesus. Will you follow Jesus today? See, if you desire to follow Jesus, I want you to understand today that there is a price to pay. And when I say that there is a price to pay, I'm not talking about what might be in here. I don't have anything in here, but some of us may have. There's a price to pay and you can't pay that price by what you might have in the bank. There is a price to pay when you choose to enter in at the narrow gate. Now to talk about that price, turn with me now over to the second chapter of first Peter. Now in the second chapter of first Peter, I want us to take a look at scripture that runs from the 19th verse through the 25th verse. And here in this passage of scripture, if you are looking at it, you will see where Peter explained the price to pay in order for one to follow Jesus. If you happen to be taking a quick glance at it, now we're going to go over this scripture here, but we'll see there where Peter, he spoke about the difficult path that he witnessed firsthand Jesus take in, in his life, in his physical life, if you will. There in the 23rd verse, we'll see where Peter spoke about how Christ was reviled. 
That means that he was hated. Christ was hated. And when he was reviled, when he was hated, Peter said that Christ did not revile in return. He did not hate in return. He did not answer hate with hate while he was on his journey. So why was Christ hated? Well, Jesus, he said in his own words that he was despised and hated because he was not of this world. Yes, of course, we know that Jesus, that he, that he came from eternity. So yes, we can literally take that meaning that he was not of this world. But from another aspect, Jesus was not of this world because he was holy and because he was righteous. And as we saw in, in our Sunday school lesson for this week, for today, in order for one to become holy and righteous, they must live by the word of God. They must walk in the divine truth. Jesus, he lived by the word of God. He walked in the divine truth. And because he did that, he found difficulty on his journey in the world, despising him, in the world, hating him. Jesus, he said that he was hated by the world because he testified of the works of the world being evil. He spoke against the works of the world and then by the manner in which he moved, by the manner that he walked, by the manner in him living by the truth, he was a walking testimony. He was a living testimony that testified against the works of this world being evil. And because he lived in a certain manner, speaking against the manner in which the world would live in, the world hated his guts. Even those who were religious leaders, they hated Jesus. They despised him. And so we'll see there in that 23rd verse that Peter, he wrote that when Jesus, when he suffered, when he endured persecution, if you will, Jesus, he did not threaten. He, he was persecuted, but he did not threaten. And there in that same verse, we'll see that Peter, he spoke about how Jesus, how Jesus held his head high, how he committed himself to the way of righteousness. The pathway that Jesus was walking down was the path to glory, the way of righteousness. And again, on the way of righteousness, he was despised by the world. He was persecuted by those who he testified against in the manner in which he lived. Like I said, there are many hindrances many obstacles that are on that narrow path. And Jesus, he walked down that narrow path. And the most remarkable thing about all of it, I'm going to work my way backwards now to the 22nd verse, is that, again, we'll see that, that Peter said there that Jesus, he committed no sin. He said that there was no deceit in his mouth. He could easily, easily answer hate with hate, but he didn't do it, did he? And then we'll see there that Peter said there in the 21st verse that in all that Jesus suffered and all that he endured, Peter, he concluded that Christ, he set an example. And look who Peter said that he set the example for. Peter said that he set the example for not just me. I'm patting my chest, but y'all ought to be patting your chest as well because he set the example for you. And for all of those who say that they believe, 
for all of those who are actually sincere in their faith. Jesus, in the way that he went, he set the example for us as believers to follow. And so again, I ask you today, will you follow him? Will you follow Jesus down the path to glory? Will you follow him in the way of righteousness? Will you actually do it or will you say, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian? Like I said, there's a difference between saying and then doing. We ought to be doing today. So if you desire to follow Jesus, I ask you again, do you think you can live by his example? You see, it's a must if you desire to walk down his pathway. It is a must if you desire to get to heaven. It is a must if you desire to be glorious and to be righteous one day in glory. It is a must that you follow in the way of Christ. You can't go your own way and get to heaven. You have to follow in the way of Christ. This is a difficult path to take. And I say to you today that I know that I'm doing my very best, even though that it is difficult, I'm doing my best to put forth the effort of faith because that is what God desires out of us, the effort. God is tired of hearing us say that we are Christians. God is tired of hearing us say that we are believers. He is now looking for us to be, to do, in other words. See, there are many professed believers. There are many Bible thumpers. There are many Bible readers who aren't going to see heaven one day. God desires for you to actually move down the pathway that is narrow. So one that desires to follow Jesus, they must determine whether or not they can handle the difficulty of the path. Can you handle this difficulty? The journey is a difficult one for, for one to be able to take. Because again, Jesus said there that we have a cross, not his cross. We all have our own cross that we must take up, that we must carry. Now, now to be clear, I'm not talking about you picking up a cross, a physical cross, and carrying that cross like Jesus did of Golgotha. That, that's not what I am talking about. So somebody may be wondering, Pastor, what does it mean to take up my cross? What is my cross? What is our cross? Well, let us consider for a moment what it meant for Jesus to, to, to take up his cross. Now, when Christ, when he took up his cross, we know that he ended up being hung on the cross. He was physically hung on the cross, but he was hung on the cross for a spiritual purpose. He hung on the cross as a sacrifice for us. He gave himself for, for me. He gave himself for you. He gave himself to deliver us from sin, from, from the second death, right? Now, to the disciples over in the 15th chapter of John's gospel, you can turn over there if you want to. And Jesus, he said in the 13th verse there that, there is no greater love than for one to lay down their life for their friend. No greater love, Jesus said, than for one to lay down their life for their friends. Now, was this Jesus telling us that we need to die for our friends? Are we supposed to hang on a cross for our friends? What, what in the world would that do? What is that going to do? Our death is, is going to do anything for, for anybody as far as saving them from sin. And Jesus, he said to the disciples there in, in the 14th verse, if you're looking at it, he said, you are my friends, he said to the disciples. 
you are my friends if, there's a caveat, if you do whatever I command you. Are you a friend of Jesus today? We always talking about being his friend. We seen, we saw in the hymn this morning about how we have a friend in Jesus. If you are a friend of Jesus, I ask you now, are you following him? What are you doing for him? Now, I want to be clear here. Christ, he didn't call on you to die for him. Christ didn't call on anybody to die for him. He didn't call on us to die for anybody else. No, no, Christ, he called on us there. If you look again at the 14th verse, he calls on us to live, doesn't he? He said there that, that if we are a friend of his, that we should be doing whatever it is that he has commanded us to do. So are you doing what Jesus commanded of you to do? Have you taken up that cross to follow him? You know, the cross that, that, that you carry, it calls on you to sacrifice. The cross that we as believers carry, it calls on us to sacrifice ourselves. But again, that's not sacrificing our lives. We, we, we aren't supposed to be dying for Christ or anybody else. That's what I just said, right? Our sacrifice, again, if we take a look at that 14th verse, our sacrifice is about our obedience. What are we obedient to? Are we obedient to ourselves? Are we obedient to somebody else? Or are we obedient to the way of righteousness? Are we obedient to Christ? Are we following him or are we following our own lust, our own passions, our own wants? Are we following after the lust, the passions and the wants of, of somebody else? Are you being obedient today? Are you following Christ today? Rather than being obedient to our our wants and our lust and, and our passions, we are to be obedient to the way of Christ. That is the sacrifice that, that we are to make. As I said before, many see being obedient to the way of Christ as sacrificing their free will. They say, nope. They, they'll get to the narrow gate. They'll start down it. But as soon as Jesus say, hey, y'all need to follow me. Y'all need to go exactly where it is that I'm going. Many say, oh, no, nah, I can't do that. I, I, I want to go my own way. And they'll spin around and they'll go the other way instead of following Jesus. How is that faith? You see, many are adamant in that they aren't going to give up their free will. They aren't going to give up their choices. Many, many desire to hold on to, to their free will. And they hold on to that free will living as a sinner. There are many professed believers today. All of those, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, folks, that don't actually move by faith. They aren't moving according to their obedience or being obedient to the word of God. They're moving to their own way, their own obedience, and they're living like a sinner. And then they actually think, they actually believe that living according to the way of sin and professing, hey, I'm a Christian, they actually think that they're going to get to heaven. I tell you today, you better start thinking again. Now, those that live the lifestyle of a sinner, they will seek to push their lifestyle off on all of us who are trying to walk down that narrow path. They'll try to push it on us, trying to knock us off the course. But if, again, if you desire to follow Christ, if you desire to reach the kingdom of heaven, if you desire to continue down the path of glory, I tell you today that you must stay the course. You must be steadfast in, in your walk. You must deny the nature of sin. Because the nature of sin, all it's going to do is take you back around. You're going to take an exit off that narrow path and you're going to end up on 
the broad path that leads to death, that leads to destruction. We must ignore the temptation of sin. When sin is saying, hey, this is the exit, we must ignore that exit. Again, we went over this in January. We recognize the doors of God. We are able to do it because the Holy Spirit resides in us. And so we should be staying the course when the Holy Spirit tells us to go that way, we should be going that way. When the Holy Spirit leads us that way, we should be going that way. See, we again must understand that when we go down the narrow path, that sin, that is the hindrance. That is the obstacle for us. And, and it is trying to knock us off course. It is trying to take us back around to the wide gate. So how do we make it through the darkness of sin as we travel down that narrow path? Well, there in the 12th verse, Jesus, he instructed his followers to love others as Christ has loved us. You see, we should keep in mind the love that Christ had for us. We must keep in mind all that he endured in his suffering for us. If you desire to reach glory, Peter called on servants there in the 18th verse to be submissive or to subject to their masters. To be subject, to be subject that, that is a choice. That means that you are choosing to do so. Believers, we are to have an attitude that is lowly, an attitude that is humble. We are to strive to live peaceably in this world on our journey. Peter, he also said that one must be willing to endure. One must be willing to endure grief. One must be willing to suffer wrongly, he said there in the 19th verse. We must be willing to do it with all patience, he said there. And again, when many of us, we begin to hear that, we said, nope, I'm getting off this pathway. I ain't submitting to nobody. I ain't enduring no grief. I ain't enduring no, no suffering with patience. I'm getting off this pathway. I'm going to hop off right now. Yeah, and to walk the pathway of Christ, we have seen the example. We must not hate. We must not answer hate with hate. We, again, when we're persecuted, we must not be trying to threaten them back. I'm going to get you back for what you done did to me. No, we should be leaving that mess behind us. To walk the path to glory, we must, as Jesus held his head high, we must learn to hold our heads high. As Jesus was, was committed to the way of righteousness, committed to walking down that pathway, guess what? You, all of us as sincere believers, we must be committed to the same as well. Are you committed to entering through the narrow gate? Are you committed to, to going down that narrow pathway that will open up? Are you committed today? Are you living today following Christ? Think about that for a moment. There in the 20th verse, Peter, he said that it is commendable if one suffers the difficulties of the narrow path of following Christ. He said that it is commendable if we do that with a mind that is for God. You see, Peter, he knew firsthand what it was like to take the road that was less traveled. He knew firsthand what it was like to, to suffer and to have many difficulties. And, and, and the thing about it is that Peter, he continued to continue down that pathway. He chose to keep on moving forward in faith. Now, all of us who have been on this, this journey for a long time, we know the difficulties. We know that it ain't easy. But I hope that by this point in time that you are continuing to walk forward on that pathway. That you are setting the example for somebody that's standing at the narrow gate right now. Somebody that is journeying down the narrow gate, the narrow path, they just started out. I hope that you are setting the example for them. 
so that they will continue to walk down the narrow path. Because again, we know that the narrow path, it opens up. You see, Peter, he chose to continue down that pathway because he saw the reward of the narrow path with his own eyes. When we look back at my response and reading for today, we'll see there in the 27th verse of the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel that Jesus, he promised that there is a reward that he will give to those that take up their cross and that follows him. And over in the 17th chapter, we'll take a look at the second verse there. We'll see that Jesus, he showed the reward to Peter, James, and to John, where he transfigured before them. And the scripture tells us that, that Jesus' face that shone like the sun and his clothes, they, they became white as light. You see, the transfiguration of Christ that is the picture of our future. That is the picture of our heavenly future. What we will become if we stay the course. If, if we stay on the pathway of righteousness. That transfiguration, that is a picture of what you're going to look like one day, bro, Harry. That is a picture of what you're going to look like one day, Andrew, Sister Horton. That is our future if we walk by faith, if we follow Christ. Do you desire to be clothed in glory today? I hope that you do. See, as believers travel down that narrow path, it begins to open up. We saw the funnel. And that, that funnel, it leads to life, Jesus said. All that pressing down that we endure on this pathway, all those hardships that we go through, all it's doing is creating nothing but a diamond. All it is doing is, is creating the perfect gem. Over in the book of Revelation in the 19th chapter, in the 8th verse, is Jesus, he... He showed to John a picture that I want to show with all of you, that I want to share with all of you today. You see, our feeble bodies, these bodies of ours that, that are constantly dying day by day, that are constantly giving up on us, it's going to be transfigured. In the twinkling of an eye, we are going to transform. And there in that eighth verse, it is revealed to her, the her being there, the wife of the lamb, the wife of the lamb being the church, all of those that sincerely believe in Christ. To her, the scripture says, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Again, the her there is the wife of the lamb, the wife of the lamb is us, believers. The picture is already there of you having your fine linen, of you being clothed in glory and in honor, in righteousness. Do you again desire to follow Jesus? I have never hidden this from you to where the picture is already set. We are already in heaven. All we are doing right now is taking our journey to fulfill that picture. All you have to do to fulfill that picture, to make that picture a reality, is stay the course. Choose to follow Jesus. I don't know about you today, but again, heaven is always on my mind. I see what this world is today. All of the hate that is constantly spewed. The wars, the oppressions, the suffering. And I desire better. I desire to live. Do you desire to live? 
if you desire to live, you follow Jesus. If you desire something else, you stay on that bride path and you will get something else. And that's something else. It ain't going to be something that you'd want in the end. So again, I encourage all of you today, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus down the narrow path to be arrayed in the beauty of his glory and to find life. That is what I encourage all of you today. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this sermon and that you'll be able to apply what you have watched, that you have heard, that you have listened to. Apply it to yourself and then share it with somebody somewhere. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following the Newfound Faith channel. Be sure that you're following today so that you don't miss a sermon, so that you don't miss a Sunday school lesson, a Bible study, or a food for thought. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you share the Newfound Faith channel with someone somewhere.